Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you Cram Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we will have a chat about a paper entitled Analgesia and Initial Management of Acute Pancreatitis, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Controlled Trials. Uh, Prof Saba will then continue his talks on evidence-based medicine. I'll leave you to it. Hello everyone, my name is Tega and presenting with me is Gio. We are presenting a review on this paper titled um, Analgesia in the Initial Management of Acute Pancreatitis, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Control Trials. It was published in um, World Journal of Surgery in January this year, and we've attached a link just in case you want to go through it at a later time. Next, you, Gio. Yeah, so despite treating acute pancreatitis on a fairly regular basis, we don't really know what the best analgesic strategy is uh, to treat these patients. Gl guidelines out there uh, tend to provide a variety of, of advice, not particularly clear. And in practice, uh, you'd find that the vast majority of people will start with a combination of paracetamol and mild opiate and some rescue. Uh, opiate analgesia, uh, occasionally a PCA. Um, so in this context, the aim of, of this systematic review is to provide an up-to-date review of evidence from uh, RCTs to determine the most effective analgesic strategy in managing pain associated with acute pancreatitis. So, ball back to you, Tega. Okay. So um, the methods used, so they carried out a systematic review and meta-analysis using the following databases, PubMed, Medline, and Bayes, and the rest. And their inclusion criteria were randomized control trials, um, tests that were done in English language and had a primary focus on acute pancreatitis. They also had included tests that had um, one or more comparisons between analgesic modes um, medications and they excluded all non-randomized um, trials, observational, retrospective, and cohort studies. Um, risk of bias was assessed using the Cochrane um, risk of bias 2, and then the publication bias was assessed using the funnel plots. So um, the authors set out um, as a primary outcome adequacy of pain relief at day one and two versus baseline um, pain, um, which is overall a fairly reasonable uh, primary outcome overall considered and given uh, how um, pain is generally reported and, and the efficacy of pain relief. Uh, secondary outcomes that they considered are length of stay, um, side effects associated with the trial drug, uh, adverse effects generally associated with the medications used uh, in the various trials, and mortality when this was reported. Uh, the authors extrapolated pain scores from the papers uh, included in their meta-analysis and they standardized those pain scores in a 0 to 100 scale to make it comparable throughout. Um, statistical heterogeneity uh, was determined using fairly standard tests such as I-square and Cochrane-Q test. So this is um, a Prisma flow um, chart showing how they got the included studies. Initially, they had about 2,004 records got in from about three databases. And with their inclusion and exclusion criteria, they finally um, arrived at 12 studies that were included. And this spanned from 1984 to 2020. Of these four, of these 12, four were from Germany, two India, one each from the UK, Denmark, Spain, USA, Switzerland, and Turkey. This is a, a table that summarizes the main characteristics of the populations included in the various uh, RCTs. Um, if you look at the etiology of the acute pancreatitis, as you can see, it's pretty standard for the populations that we see on our wards. Goldstones is generally the most common alcohol, um, hyperlipidemia, ERCP, and a bunch of idiopathic and, and sort of uh, unknown cause type pancreatitis. Um, I guess this... Um, table highlights again how there is a, 
a reasonable degree of, of clinical heterogeneity of the various studies included. Um, if you look at the severity of the pancreatitis, some studies include only mild, some only severe, some a mixture of them. So um, it, it's hard to see a standardized population in the background, really. Uh, and finally, the bottom part of the table is very important, highlights what types of analgesic strategies are, are included in these studies. And as you can see, the vast majority of trials included opiates uh, or, and, and, and a combination of, of other um, analgesic protocols, uh, including placebo in four trials. Back to, now to the results um, for the primary outcome, they looked at pain relief. And um, there was some improvement seen in the visual analog scale of pain scores used um, across all trials from baseline to day two. Uh, epidural was found out to have the most um, effect in 24 hours. And then by 48 hours, opiates were comparable with it. And um, local anesthetics seem to have had the least overall efficacy. Um, about all 12 trials used um, the visual analog scale as their assessment of pain in patients. And then um, in addition, some other trials, not all, some used rescue analgesia, some used um, free pain periods, some used uh, the painful periods, and then just one trial used um, the time to achieve pain relief. And then um, another of their primary outcome was comparison between opiates and non-opiates, of which there was no significant difference in the VS scores at baseline and at 24 hours. And then as um, we already know, most of the, those in the opiates group came down with um, 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 symptom of the side effects of nausea. Um, also on this page, you see the um, forest plot that shows the visual um, analog scale scores on day one, comparing majorly the opiates and non-opiates. Um, let's have a quick glance at the secondary outcome. So uh, length of stay, uh, well, pretty much whenever you give people some sort of analgesia versus placebo, that seems to work better uh, in terms of length of stay. And I, I presume that that is a relatively obvious thing. Um, generally speaking, epidural uh, seems to be better than a PCA, although it's obviously more invasive, and buprenorphine seems to be more effective than procaine. Again, uh, I guess that's uh, um, not an unexpected outcome. Um, I guess, again, this part of the slide really reiterates how there's so many different pain protocols compared to each other in this meta-analysis. Um, side effect and adverse events, um, they were reported only in 10 out of 12 trials, trials included. Uh, no trial was specifically designed to look at side effects or adverse events. However, the authors as you can uh, see at the bottom of the slide, did not really identify any significant differences between the various treatments uh, considered. Uh, deaths were reported only in eight trials, uh, only specifically related to that admission, and no deaths were attributed to medications that were uh, tested. Um, so now to the self-reported limitations mentioned in the um, study. They mentioned they had a um, Positive of data after 24 hours to adequately compare between the different analgesic medications used. Um, they were also, due to lack of um, detailed reporting also, they were also unable to compare the effects of opiates on the local or systemic complications in patients who came down with um, acute pancreatitis. And since most of, some of the studies were actually done before the revised Ant um, Atlanta classification, uh, it was a bit difficult to compare complications and the disease progressions against the different analgesic classes used. Um, another um, reported limitation was that the prolonged time span of the studies they picked, um, which spanned from the 1980s to um, the 2020s, um, and also, um, none of these trials actually um, included data um, about the quality of life and also um, patient-related um, reported outcomes. And then um, the visual analog scale was more or less quite subjective, so uh, it was one of the limitations they noted. Um, Gio, do you mind talking about the others? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> these are a few points that um, uh, we have uh, picked up, uh, apart from what the authors reported. Um, the authors highlight in their methods how they uh, would choose a random effect uh, when designing their meta-analysis, which is, uh, by the looks of it, uh, quite appropriate because there's a lot of statistical heterogeneity between the various papers included 
uh, in this meta-analysis. However, it does look like this choice was made a priori, or at least it wasn't particularly justified. And I found that that was a little bit weird. Um, as I mentioned throughout this presentation, I think twice or three times, there's a lot of clinical heterogeneity between the various papers included. Both populations are different, treatments provided are different, classification of pancreatitis is different. So the applicability of the summed up effect and the reliability of, of these uh, sort of effect sizes that, that we see in a pool meta-analysis might be limited by that. Um, and again, looking through the results and looking through their methods, um, I kept asking myself, or, or thinking at least, that this uh, sort of dual comparison, opiates versus non-opiate, which forms the bulk of this paper, really, um, is a little bit forced. Uh, and that ultimately, you're comparing a group of different types of opiates versus a group of a variety of interventions. And perhaps a network meta-analysis in this context would have done uh, a better job. That's just a suggestion. Um, choice of outcome, I think Tega already uh, hinted to this, um, is obviously partially forced by the um, published literature, um, perhaps analyzing the use of rescue analgesia in a meta-analysis context for the six papers that reported it could have been helpful and give us a more sort of um, a less biased um, outcome in terms of comparing different analgesic um, protocols. And finally, in clinical practice, a lot of people, including myself, use combinations of different strategies. Um, we will start with opiates, uh, generally mixed with some anti-inflammatories, uh, and then we would escalate depending on the on clinical requirements. So defining a particularly effective, a single particularly effective um, analgesic strategy might not be particularly helpful uh, in this in this context because we use multiple of them. Okay. So in conclusion, um, this review demonstrated that there are quite a lot of other alternatives to opiate-based analgesia in treatment of patients with acute pancreatitis. Um, they also noted that NSAIDs are not used enough, um, and I'm thinking mostly likely due to the complications or fear of the complications. And even if we know some of them have good analgesic and um, anti-inflammatory properties. Um, epidural from this um, review was shown to have um, the most effects in the first 24 to 48 hours, even if its use may be limited in certain centers because of the need for um, high dependency monitoring. And also, um, we need um, um, newer or comprehensive pain assessment tools that will be more objective in assessing um, patients' pain scores. This table just shows a brief summary of everything that we've mentioned so far in this paper. Thank you. As usual, a brief summary of what we discussed after presenting the paper. First of all, we reiterated the point that there is a lot of clinical heterogeneity in the papers included and when papers are so different from each other uh, and their results get pulled together in a meta-analysis uh, there is a genuine concern that the final effect estimates might actually not be reliable and as highlighted in the Cochrane handbook uh, after a systematic review a meta-analysis is not always necessary or indicated. Uh, if a meta-analysis were to be undertaken in these settings, we reiterated that perhaps a network approach would be more appropriate, allowing a comparison between the different treatments included in, in the RCTs. Uh, we discussed uh, issues related to the external validity of this meta-analysis and the applicability of the findings to everyday clinical practice. Uh, we highlighted a few points during the presentation, such as the use of combination, and the fact that we tend to titrate these analgesic strategies to the patient's needs. Uh, however, um, there are also a couple of extra points that uh, we made, such as uh, perhaps pain in the first 48 hours is not very reliable as an indicator of overall analgesic requirements uh, in uh, an admission that could be uh, very, very long. Uh, generally, uh, is more than 48 hours after the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. And uh, there are out there a fairly standardized protocol on how to tackle pain, such as the WHO analgesic ladder, uh, and most clinicians would normally follow that. Uh, we'll puzzle the questions to the authors. 
as usual, and uh, keep an eye out for the letter. I'll leave you to Prof. Sabah lecture now. Thank you. So what I thought I should uh, talk about today is uh, expand on the acquiring evidence part of evidence-based practice. So we talked about acquiring evidence last time, uh, and I thought I should uh, run through an example um, of something I would uh, look for evidence as part of my practice and, and uh, use that to highlight uh, what you can do in your own sort of uh, practice or uh, as you interact with patients. So acquiring evidence is um, the second step in the practice of ABM, as you um, already know. The five steps are listed on the screen here. Ask, acquire, appraise or interpret, apply and evaluate or assess. Yeah, so you could, you could think of it as a five A's. Ask, acquire, appraise, apply and assess. So we're talking about acquiring the evidence. Last time, we talked about types of clinical questions. If you remember, uh, I mentioned foreground questions and background questions. I'll mention them again. We talked about some search techniques like concept building. Uh, we talked about keywords, mesh headings, Boolean operators, and searching in phrases within quotes, searching um, with the parentheses or brackets, nesting, and field tags. So I'm going to start off with a clinical scenario, and I'll just uh, highlight or explain how I uh, uh, tried to formulate some questions and then went to search literature and answer and try and find answers for my own sort of understanding and hopefully also for the patient's benefit. So there's a lady in her 60s who was incidentally detected to have raised CA99 during workup of her GI symptoms. Now, it wasn't very clear why the CA199 was done in the first place, and that is a, an important sort of lesson for, for, uh, for us as practicing clinicians. You don't want to do tests um, which are not directly relevant to the patient's problems. If not, you run the risk of incidentally picking up, um, picking up abnormalities, which may not have clinical relevance, but we may, which may lead to unnecessary testing and intervention. So anyway, she had raised CA99 um, and she's known to have IPMN, which is introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm of the pancreas. It's a condition in the pancreas that is often picked up on imaging. Um, it is pre-malignant. For certain types of IPMN, resection is considered uh, necessary, important. For certain other types, they're simply observed. So that's something to, to keep in the back of your mind. It will be relevant uh, later on as I discuss the case. And then she's also known to have a mesenteric cyst. Both of these conditions were being managed conservatively. Um, there wasn't an obvious cause for the raised CEA. And the patient was a little bit worried that she had this tumor marker that was high and, and, um, and people couldn't explain the reason for the tumor marker being high. And... Um, one of the clinicians looking after her did a PET scan, um, which is partly to address um, the issue of the raised CA99 to see if there's anything else and the problem, underlying problem. And the PET scan picked up a thyroid nodule, and that's how she came to see me. So um, we dealt with the thyroid nodule, but that's not the topic of discussion here. But I had a few queries about uh, this, this patient. So I've just listed a few examples, but you could have, you could have your own uh, clinical questions. You could have many other questions arising from an encounter such as this. So I was thinking, uh, right, I really need to refresh my knowledge about CA99 and uh, refresh my, uh, my, my knowledge about what conditions are linked with a raised CA99. And then I was thinking, as the patient is worried, I was wondering what is the likelihood of a false positive uh, high CA99? or the likelihood of having a high CA99 without cancer. Now, if it's a benign condition and the CA99 is raised, and that's okay, you know, we, for most of these benign lesions such as mesenteric cysts, we wouldn't intervene unless there was a complication. Um, and I then was wondering about what's the likelihood of having a raised CA99 in an otherwise sort of benign looking IPMN and a mesenteric cyst. 
And if that likelihood is high, then, then I'm reassured that I can reassure the patient. And the final question I had in the clinic was, now that we know the CA99 is raised and we haven't found anything significant, or at least not yet, um, is there any value in carrying on measuring it to see whether it's going to go higher and higher, or do we just not um, uh, measure, it, measure it at all? So uh, these are just some examples, some questions uh, that um, uh, we were thinking about in the clinic. Now, the first thing you might want to do if as a medical student or a junior surgical trainee is to uh, gain some background uh, knowledge about CA99. So you could do that. Traditionally, we used to do that when I was a medical student by, by going through the textbooks and um, hard copies in the library. Um, these days, you can look up online textbooks. And there are numerous online textbooks that are, some of them are free, some of them you have to pay that you can access. Another source which can be quite useful is what is referred to as point of care information summaries. So, um, or evidence-based reviews they're called. And you may have come across some of these um, information summaries if you subscribe to UpToDate. And there's, a, there's another one called Dynamed. There's the BMJ Best um, Evidence. And there are quite a few of these these days, which will provide you fairly up-to-date uh, summaries of information about a specific disease, about a specific drug, about a syndrome, and, uh, or an operation even. And then they can be quite useful. And these kinds of summaries are usually peer reviewed, so which is good. And uh, uh, they, some of them are freely available, but uh, a lot of them need a, a subscription. So they may not be easy to access. Another source, um, in addition to point of care information summaries, uh, would be review articles. And this is what I would go to uh, if I had a question, for example, about CA99. I'll come to that in a minute. And I'd go and find a recent review in a good quality journal. Now, you may ask, what is a good quality journal? And trying to identify good quality journals comes partly by, uh, by um, reading around a fair bit and doing this uh, repeatedly and gaining experience and knowing um, how to identify you know, good quality journals and so on. So you search for an appropriate review article, and we discussed before how we um, search for specific articles on specific topics, how we use concepts and we put the concepts together and so on. Uh, and, and the more you do this, the more regularly you go and search uh, databases to look for good review articles, the better you get at in finding a good article and then obviously reading it. Some review articles, unfortunately, might be behind a paywall and you might have to uh, you know, uh, ask your librarian to get it. Very, very few, very rarely do we really uh, pay for articles. We try and find uh, ways of getting around the payment, usually by asking um, our librarian, or we simply look for articles that are free to access. Right, so coming back to our question, uh, this lady had a raised CA99 and we, we were wanting to know more about this. So I typed in CA99 and review in PubMed and I stumbled upon this article. And this was in the World Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery and uh, uh, it talked about CA99 as a, as a tumor marker in a very broad way. And uh, um, it seemed a reasonably good uh, read. So one of the first things um, you could do, uh, and I do tend to do this, is to look at the journal, look at the institution. And um, this is really very important when you're looking at primary research where the paper is about um, patient level data. Um, it's not that important for uh, reviews, um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So the, the actual institution of the journal may not be that important as long as the review is of uh, decent quality, but that's something to think about. Now, I read this paper. I got lots of useful, useful information about CA199 that enhanced my background knowledge, made me more confident um, in talking about CA199. I'm not going to talk about that now. Um, and it also gave me some more leads for uh, doing further searches in relation to helping this particular patient. And it helped me 
refine my foreground question. So having read um, about CA99 in this review, um, I found a few important uh, bits of information. So CA99 is raised in several benign and malignant diseases. I didn't know that before, I must say, but uh, I didn't know that CA99 was associated with malignancy in IPMN. So that was a new thing for me. And I did not know that CA99 is has been associated with medullary thyroid cancer, I've got to say. Now, then, like I said before, the more you read, the more you'll be able to get further leads for further searches and also refine your foreground question. So then I started worrying about whether CA99 is a good predictor of malignancy in IPMN. And given that this lady is known to have IPMN, which is intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm of the pancreas, it's like a cystic lesion in the pancreas. And because the CA99 is raised, uh, uh, have I got to worry about that? The other thing obviously is, um, does this patient have medullary thyroid cancer? That's uh, So th those are two further foreground questions that I thought I should be looking into. So I'm just going to concentrate on the first question for the next two slides. So um, if you have a foreground question like the one I mentioned, the best thing to do would be to look up um, published articles in, and you could look them up and search for them in one of several bibliographic databases. So here are a few examples, PubMed, Embase, Sinal, and I've got to say, um, I just stick with one database and I stick with PubMed, and I'd encourage you to just get used to one database. You rarely ever have to look at multiple databases to find answers for specific clinical questions. You'd only do that if you're gonna do a systematic review, then you might do two or three databases to ensure that you captured all relevant articles um, aimed to uh, answer a specific research question. So um, when you search these databases, the most important thing to keep in mind is to start off with a clear, very clear foreground question, because a clear question helps you, helps you to come up with some concepts. And you can use these concepts in what we call concept building to formulate your search strategy. Okay, so, um, so our question was, is CA99 a good predictor of malignancy in IPMN? So I typed in CA99 as a keyword, IPMN is another keyword, combined them with AND, and I got 90 results on PubMed. This is a very recent search. Keep in mind that uh, the, the concepts CA99 and IPMN might have alternative keywords. So CA99 might be referred to as carbohydrate antigen 99 or Sala Lewis antigen A and so on. Similarly, IPMN might go by many different words. So you could, uh, so you've got to keep those in mind and maybe use those alternative keywords or use um, what we refer to as control vocabulary or mesh headings. And this is something we touched upon last time. So, uh, so, that, so we've, we've talked about that before. Um, 90 results was too much for me. Um, you, you know, we're, we're busy people. We've got lots of things to do. So I thought if I needed one or two articles, I'd really love to have, um, read a systematic review, which is at the top of the evidence hierarchy. It'll probably include uh, all relevant literature on the topic. So I filtered the search uh, by clicking on systematic review. And lo and behold, I landed... Uh, on a fairly good systematic review, looking at a number of uh, predictors of malignancy in IPMN, right? And this lady has IPMN and her CA99 is raised. So I looked at this review and the review uh, had two really important conclusions. One was raised serum CA99 was the most specific feature uh, that predicted malignancy in IPMNs. And um, raised uh, CA99 yielded sensitivity of 0.38 and specificity of 0 0.90 in the diagnosis of malignancy in IPMN. So this is important for me because this, this lady had a high CA99 and an IPMN, right? So it's really relevant for this lady. So then that's a very important observation. Now, if you have a test that has got 
not so high sensitivity, but a very high specificity, and you've got a, um, a positive test, that's quite significant. But we, we shouldn't jump to conclusions. We should just think a little bit about what this means and also consider what the population or setting um, was in, in which the various articles in the systematic review were conducted. We should think about what does raised mean? What's the threshold here? And then is that uh, the threshold that you have in your laboratory assay? Are we talking about similar assays? Uh, are we talking about serum and not cyst fluid and things like that? And um, is there a huge um, dose response effect? In other words, uh, is there going to be a big difference between what might be considered marginal elevation or something that is fivefold or tenfold the upper limit of the normal range. So there are all these things to think about, yeah? And also, if I'm looking at a predictive uh, marker, a biomarker, or a diagnostic test, I'd like to really see predictive values as opposed to sensitivity and specificity. Predictive values are clinically much more important. Now, I don't want to go into the details of, of uh, this particular sort of concept uh, that we've covered before, and it's kind of out of scope here, but, but, but there are a number of things to think about before we jump to uh, conclusions and, and ring alarm bells. However, a very high specificity or a very high sensitivity uh, can be quite important. For example, if you have a really high specificity, they might help to rule in disease if you have a positive test. So there's a mnemonic called SPIN, you might have heard of. SP stands for specificity, P stands for positive test and in stands for ruling in disease. So if you have a high specificity and the test is positive, then the, then the diagnosis is virtually confirmed. And here it might mean malignancy in IPMN. Similarly, you may have heard of this mnemonic called SNOUT, S-N-N-O-U-T, sensitivity, high sensitivity, negative test, you can rule out the disease. Okay, so these are just little things to keep in the back of your mind if you come across tests with high specificity or high sensitivity. But like I said, remember, ideally, you would like to have predictive values, positive and negative predictive values. And then the, those are the ones that are really useful clinically. So how does this help me and my patient? What do I need to do? Now, uh, you've got to keep in mind that uh, you may not be. I certainly am not a pancreatic surgeon. And I've just come across this patient in my practice, in my clinic. So um, this is enough for me to ask for help. Call the um, experts, the hepatobiliary experts, or send them to the liver and the pancreas MDT, um, mention this finding, and make sure that this is reviewed. Make sure that this is taken into consideration along with all the other radiological features and clinical features, and they can make the minds up as to whether this IPMN can continue to be monitored and managed conservatively, or whether they need to think about resecting this. Okay. Now I've not talked about uh, the other uh, finding uh, in my searches, which is that ray CA ninety nine can be a marker for medullary thyroid cancer as well. Um, but again, that's a lead that I'd need to follow. And this is how a, a quick and easy literature search um, can help you address uh, not just your curiosity about um, specific clinical conditions or biomarkers, but also help the patient because at the end of the day, that's the that's primary aim, isn't it? Okay, so just to summarize what I've said, uh, be inquisitive. Uh, th things might not necessarily be in your direct field of interest, but um, if it matters to the patient, then we've got to probe things a bit further to see if we have dotted the I's and crossed the T's, if you like, uh, in the management of the patient as a whole. So in searching databases and getting to the articles you need, initially you might be quite frustrated, it might take you a long time, but with practice, you will find that you get to the information you need, yeah? And you'll be able to zone in on uh, information that is relevant to you and your patient much quicker and much more efficiently. Now, um, I hope um, with this example, I've highlighted that there might be lots of protocols on how to manage race C, SCA-199, or how to manage IPMN. There might be guidelines or textbooks. And I call this tertiary sources, tertiary sources of evidence, yeah? 
but they don't necessarily help address many of our day-to-day -day problems. We've got to um, be uh, efficient and we've got to practice looking at primary and secondary sources. By primary sources, I mean original research or patient level data. By secondary sources, I mean systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Like the paper we just discussed, that's a secondary source of evidence. What you read in a textbook or guideline or maybe something like up to date, I would uh, call that tertiary sources of evidence. So tertiary sources of evidence to me help you uh, in your background needs to build up your background knowledge. But primary and secondary sources often are invaluable in answering the foreground questions that you might have. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.